relationship with God and what it's supposed to be like. So we'll, we'll talk about the marriage relationship for a little bit. We'll talk about a relationship with God. And the, the key phrase of this video is, uh, you know, how do we make God look? How do I live my life in the world? How do you live your life in the world? How do you reflect God to the world? Do you live your life, sorry, i got to turn this on, in such a way where people are attracted to God? Or is your life in such a way, I don't want to go to your church, that type. And so we're going to cover that a little bit. But my key is, I want you to have a great relationship with God. Look at with me, chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ, now this is the key, also loved the church and gave himself for it. Notice that. Even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. The word of God is powerful. It cleanses us. That's why people need to come to church, Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, because the word of God cleanses us and helps keep us clean. Uh, then it says, uh, verse 27, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing that it should be holy and without blemish. Look down at verse 32. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So as you read the entire passage, you do see that he uses the marriage relationship of what it's supposed to be like when we follow God's word, when we participate in the proper roles of the marriage relationship. That is to be compared what our relationship with Christ should be. Let's open in prayer. Father, in the name of the blood of Jesus Christ, fill me with your Holy Spirit. I pray that people's lives will be enriched and blessed through your word. Wash us, Lord. Cleanse us. Purify us. As your word says, so that you can present us before you without spot, without wrinkle. Help us in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Like I said, the heartbeat of the message is to challenge each and every one of us to have a better relationship with God. As we see in this passage, Jesus compares his relationship with us to what a marriage relationship ought to be. I say what it ought to be. In the surrounding verses, it does instruct children how to obey their parents, wives to submit themselves to their husbands, husbands to love their wives. If we do things the way God says we're supposed to, you guys will have a blessed marriage. That's if we do it that. And I remember about 35 years ago, I heard a preacher mention something about, um, he's preaching how the strength of our country is determined about the on the strength of the home, the family unit. Now, you, you try to wrap your mind around that. The strength of our nation is determined about the strength of the home. Now, in the last 35 years, if you've lived long enough, you realize how the home has been under attack. Uh, there's all kinds of wickedness that's crept in. There's all kinds of enemies out there trying to divide husband and wife away from each other. There's been enemies that attack the home by teaching you alternative ways to uh, discipline your children that are not biblical or not disciplining your children. I told a story about how, uh, you know, actually, no, it was here. I asked a question to the congregation. How many of you were raised in a home where your parents never told you no? And I was astounded at the number of hands that went up. No is not a bad thing. No is a good thing. Teaching us to submit to the authority of our parents. Well, God, def uh, there's different roles in the home. God spells out the roles of the husband, the role of the wife, the role of the children, and how they're supposed to be. But now we've come to a place in our nation where everything's been redefined, and it's totally against the Word of God. You know, the husband's supposed to be ahead of the home. The wife is supposed to submit herself to the authority of the husband. We are supposed to submit ourselves to the authority of God. Children are to submit themselves to the authority of the parents. Everything's upside down. Not only that, we've redefined marriage. It has been for thousands of years. One man, one woman, one marriage. 
today, men are marrying men. Women are marrying women, which is an abomination to the Lord. But here's the thing, and I'll not talk about this, but if you look online and you study it for yourself, look up how children that are raised in these types of homes, same-sex marriages, those kids grow up disturbed. They're depressed. They're suicidal. And these children will tell you that. They'll tell you how uh, they've been molested by lovers that are coming in. Oh, bless their hearts. They don't have a choice. Those poor kids. Let them tell you their story. And you will be astounded and you'll come to the conclusion. If no other way, reason, it's wrong. But God said it already. Why don't we just believe him? God defines the role of the husband, the wife, the children. He gives the roles and how they're supposed to be and how these healthy relationships should grow and what they produce. If both husband and wife will follow God's plan, they will grow deeper in love with each other. They will find true love in each other. They will have eyes only for each other. They will become strong and rock solid, unified as one. And I remember even as a child growing up in a home, not knowing what I was doing, but trying to divide mom and dad. If mom said no, I'd go to dad. If dad said no, I'd go to mom. And then when they learned what I was doing, I got spanked the biblical way. I got spanked and learned, don't do that. They kept unity. They stopped manipulation from going on. And children, we, we don't have to be taught that. We just do it as kids. You did it as kids as well. You just do it. Um, and so another thing about God's biblical way, the, uh, mom and dad, husband and wife, they go out of their way for each other. They do special things for each other because they love each other. They try to do things that uplift and honor each other. They hate being apart. They're never saying a derogatory term about the other in public or in private. They praise each other. They don't talk about the old woman or the old man. They don't do that because they're following God's pattern. I've learned something from the Bible. The Bible says from out of the mouth. I'm sorry. From, um, what is it? <laughs> Help me out. From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. If it's in here, it's coming out here. You can say how right you are with God, but if those kind of things come out of your mouth, you're wicked. You're defiled. Because those words coming out of your mouth come from your heart. So what do you do? You get cleaned up. You repent. Ask God to forgive you and stop that foolish behavior. The idea of a relationship that Christ wants us to have, God's ways do certain things. They bring beauty into the relationship. They bring beauty into the relationship of husband and wife. They bring glory into that. Let me share something about my parents specifically. They have not always been right, but they have a strong marriage. They've been married for 52 years now. I remember my dad would go to work every night. He worked midnights. And every night before he went to work, he always kissed my mom and hugged her. Every morning when he would come home, I could hear the truck coming down the street. My mom would greet him at the door. They would hug and kiss every morning. And I remember even just recently, I was up there helping my dad put up tree stands, you know, during the spring and everything. We're getting everything ready for hunting. And... Uh, my dad uh, and I were cutting trees. My mom was in there moving things around, helping out. She drove the four-wheeler out, and she's moving stuff. Get back. We don't want the tree to fall on you. And then he got so caught up in watching my mom, and he wasn't even paying attention to me or anything else, and he's got a smile on his face. He starts chuckling. He says, man, I love that girl. That's sweet. I saw my dad, heard him say that, unaware of me being there and paying attention. I thought, that is what it's all about. That's a beautiful picture of what a marriage builds up to be. But that's the kind of relationship God wants to have with us, where he looks down at you and chuckles. Mistakes, doesn't matter. Where he looks at you and chuckles and says, I love that person. That's my child. See, that's what he wants with us. Well, this morning, I want to give you three things about your relationship with God that compares to the marriage relationship. One, the beauty of the relationship. Two, 
things that harm the relationship, and three, things that build the relationship. Let me start with the first one, the beauty of the relationship. First, there must be a relationship. That means you must be born again. You've got to be saved. You've got to be one of his children. And God says salvation is for all. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's why Jesus Christ died on the cross. He came, he was born to die for sinners. He came to, to pay for our sins so that we can go to heaven someday. And, and the Bible even says, No greater love hath a man than this, than a man lay down life for his friends. And I call you friends, he says. He came to pay for all of our sins so that we can all go to heaven. But only, only those who come to Jesus Christ and accept that free gift will go to heaven. Um, and so you've got to have a relationship. Marriage, a relationship. Uh, let me see, what was I saying here? Um, it, for a marriage relationship to work, both parties need to be saved as well. It really works better that way. I had uh, some friends over last night, they, and a cute couple, young couple. They're, uh, they'll probably end up coming here someday. But, you know, uh, they've made mistakes in their life. And, and as they're sitting across the table, uh, they talk about how when they came to Jesus Christ recently, and, and she has a Bible background, he didn't. And they would get together in the evenings, and she would read scriptures to them and teach them. Beautiful. Sitting down together and going through God's word together. And then he got a, a little teary-eyed, and he's talking about the last few months of his life has been hard. He's got a cyst on his spinal uh, cord. And, and because of that, his leg gives out on him from time to time. And there's times when he's in excruciating pain. And as I'm listening to this, this thought crossed my mind. That man is blessed. He's got a wife that will never leave him. Even though if he were to end up in a wheelchair, she'll love him. She'll take care of him for the rest of his life. She won't have to worry about him, her. Uh, he won't have to worry about her sleeping around or anything. The man's blessed. That's what God wants in our marriages. That's what God wants a relationship with us as well. A beautiful one. Recently, this has to do with uh, forgiveness. Forgiveness is a ma plays a major key in marriage as well. There was a survey uh, that was uh, conducted over 200 married adults in regards to forgiveness. The researchers were wondering how one's ability to forgive others would affect their marital satisfaction and their personal well-being. The results were astounding. The research suggests that there is a huge relationship between marriage, marriage satisfaction, and forgiveness. In fact, it, it appears that as much as one-third of our marriage satisfaction is related to forgiveness. Not only does the ability to forgive impact the marriage relationship, it is significantly related to a person's emotional distress as well. As forgiveness uh, ability went up, individuals reported fewer symptoms of depression, anxiety, and fatigue. You see, you've got to have salvation. You say, why is salvation so important? Because in salvation, you find forgiveness. Jesus was born to die for our sins so that we can be forgiven for all of them. When Jesus Christ died, our sins were placed upon him. And it's paid in full. And all you have to do is receive them. The Bible says in Psalms 103 that his Salvation is so powerful that his forgiveness is so strong that as far as east is from the west, that's how far our sins are separated from us. And the east and the west, my friend, never meet. Forgiveness. We need to learn to accept forgiveness. We need to learn to come to the place before the cross of Christ where we declare ourselves guilty before Christ and said, I am a sinner and you paid for my sins and confess your sins to Christ and receive the forgiveness that he offers to all. And then from that point on, when you learn to be forgiven, then you can learn to forgive others as well. When you learn from what you've been forgiven from, we understand that the petty things that others have done to us, we can forgive those as well. Forgiveness is a major key in salvation. And Jesus says, for the Son of Man 
has come to seek and to save that which is lost. His forgiveness has done great things for us. He come to seek us and to save us. We need to understand what forgiveness does as well. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12, it says, But this man, that's Jesus, after he offered one sacrifice for sins forever, that's his sacrifice of his body, sat down on the right hand of God. Then he says this, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Those that are sanctified, those that receive Christ as their Savior. That means when you receive Christ's forgiveness, he says, I make you perfect in me. Through my sacrifice and you receiving it, I've made you perfect. But I don't feel perfect. I keep sinning, but not as much as I used to. And the sin pattern, I sin less and less and less through time as I grow closer to him. He says, but I still make you perfect in me. How about that? Because Christ says, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. I can go on about how Christ is our peacemaker. The great things he's done, he's the one that makes the changes in our life. He, Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called on circumcision by that which is called the circumcision of the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, hath no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who are sometimes afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. In a nutshell, when you come to Christ, he makes you perfect. He does the work in your heart. He does the work in your life. And when you allow him to, he does wonderful things. I talked to my class about keys to under, overcoming temptation. And one of the keys to overcoming temptation is a fully surrendered life to Christ. Now, I gave the illustration of this. I poured a cup of coffee in there. And um, I took a couple bags of sugar and compared it with sin, just for an illustration. Here's a cup of coffee, nothing in it. Now, this is just a little bit of sin. I poured it in there and stirred it up a little bit. And I said, does it matter if our lives have just a little bit of sin in it? Because that's the way we treat life. Well, a little bit of sin doesn't matter. This is what I like. But when you drink it, huh, that little bit of sugar flavors the whole cup. That little bit of sin saturates the entire being it consumes it so does it matter yes it does it does matter in our lives let me move on to the second thing things that harm the relationship go with me to first john chapter 4 first john chapter 4 while you're turning there some of the things people have said that harm the relationship things like expectations that are never met desires that are never satisfied Frustrations that are fueled, selfishness, singleness of heart, things like that, being selfish. A man wrote, Dear Abby, I like this, you'll get a kick out of it. He says, Dear Abby, I'm in love, and I'm having an affair with two different women other than my wife. I love my wife, but I also love these two women. Please tell me what to do, but don't give me any of that garbage about morality. Please... It, about morality, all right? And then he signed it, too much love for only one. Well, dear Abby writes, dear too much love for only one. The only difference between humans and animals is morality. Please write to a veterinarian. <laughs> I love it. Classic. All right. Well, she was right in what she says. There are a lot of things in the marriage that uh, harm it. But let me, let me say this. When God speaks about the marriage relationship, I'll read a verse in a little bit, but let me kind of give it to you in advance as well. We are created for God's glory. Our lives are to bring glory to him, but when we live in sin, we do not bring glory to him. We bring shame. The Bible also says that the wife is for the glory of the man. Some women don't like that because that means your life surrounds him. And there's different Bible illustrations, events that happen to different people 
that uh, where shame was brought into the marriage relationship by either the husband or by the wife. But there's supposed to be a beautiful relationship there. And I'm to bring glory to my Father in heaven by the way I live my life, by the way I respond to others, by the way my speech is delivered to different people. But I can also bring shame to him through my speech, through the way I live my life. Here's the other thing. In the marriage relationship, the wife is to build up and exalt and honor the wife. I'm sorry, the husband is to build up and exalt and honor the wife. The husband's supposed to do that. The wife is to bring, bring glory and honor to the husband, never shame. But picture this for just a moment. Here's the wife, never satisfied, nagging the husband. Always, he's not good enough. He's not meeting the bills. He's not working hard enough. Nagging, 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 talking bad about him to the other girls and women and stuff. Is she bringing glory to her husband? Absolutely not. What if he comes home and she never cooks? She doesn't clean the house. She doesn't mind the kids and so on. What kind of a home is that? It doesn't bring glory to him. How do people like that abide? They just last years together. But what's going to happen in a situation like that? Somebody else comes along. He's out the door. It happens. It's not the way God intended to be. Well, what about the man? Here's the man. You know, he goes home, loves his wife and everything, but he goes to work and talks trash. Talks trash about her. Uses the foul language and everything like this to other guys. When the guys see the wife, what do they think? You married this loser? Because he is a loser. He doesn't bring glory to his wife. He brings shame to her. See, that's not the way Christians ought to act. Christians ought to bring glory to God because God sees everything. He sees it all. And he's meant for the husband and wife relationship to be rock solid, where they lift and build each other up, like my dad's saying, standing there, tunnel vision. Oh, I love that gal. Man, I got to see my dad like that. What does that do for me? That encourages me to love my wife. But when kids grow up in homes where there's yelling and cursing and swearing and all kinds of stuff, they're going to do the same thing they did, their parents did. Mm. Losers. Losers. But they don't have to be that way. 1 John 5, uh, 4, 4, 15. Whosoever shall confess the Lord Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. And we know, we have known and believed that uh, the love that God hath to us, God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. Here in his love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. He's the definition of love. I don't know how to love except for I follow him. And I see and experience his forgiveness. And so he teaches me how to forgive. My kids learn forgiveness through me. They learn leadership through me. They learn failure through me. They learn success through me. I learn love through my Father in heaven. I learn forgiveness from my Father in heaven. I learn to be successful from my Father in heaven. Do you see how it correlates? Do you see how it works? Are you learning from your Father in heaven? Is your life changing because you're listening to your Father in heaven? From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. What's going on in the heart? How is your heart? We learn love because he first loved us. God was the first to display love toward us. Let me give you the last one, things that build a relationship. We need to have a moral obligation. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now, it's true. God takes us from where we're at. We're sinners. All of us. For all of sin come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous. No, not one. But he doesn't leave us there, folks. He takes us. He changes us. He builds us up like I read. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. 
And so he changes us. He doesn't leave us in the pits and the mud and the mire. If you're in there and stay in there, it's your fault because you're not following him. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. That's homosexuality. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. We'll stop there for just a second. He's listing a whole bunch of things that we've probably done many of those things. We can look at that list. Those are the things. Those people will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those people will not go to heaven. But look at the next verse. And such were some of you. But you are washed. How? But you are sanctified. You are set apart from those things. But you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. You say, what happened, preacher? They came to Christ as a fornicator, as a liar, as a filthy mouth, filthy hearted, perverted person. They come to Jesus Christ. They get on their knees and say, please forgive me. Please save me. Please give me that love that I've seen you share with me and others. Come into my heart and be my God. And then he says, I'll take you and I'll do a work in your heart. I will change you and make you one of those and such were some of you. But he says, please come to me and let me do that. Fully surrender to me and let me do a work in your life that nowhere you can find this in the, in the world. So things that were just not to do. When you come to Christ, he's going to stop you from lying. When you come to Christ, he's going to stop you from cheating. He's going to change the filthy mouth and clean it up from the heart out. He's going to stop you from bringing shame into your marriage and shame into your relationship with him. He's going to make you face your responsibility. He's going to teach the men to be the proper role model in the home that they ought to be. They're going to teach the women, the wives, to be the proper role model in their home. And he's going to take your marriage and make it closer and stronger. He's going to teach you how to raise your children so that they can follow your example, so that they won't end up like you were, so they can have a better chance at a relationship. Something I've seen, sin is filthy. Sin is ugly. Vulgarity is filthy. Vulgarity is ugly. But one thing I've noticed, and I think you'll agree, you find a couple that's got sin in their lives. That filthiness follows them in every other part of their life. Just go to their homes. Go inside and you'll see it. But when people get their hearts right with God, you'll see their homes clean up as well. It's a picture of what's in here. I promise you, you'll see that to be true. Because God does not leave us where we're at. He cleans us up from the inside out. He gives you something worth living for. And that cleanliness, that holiness radiates in you and in the rest of your life. And God doesn't leave us poor. He doesn't leave you uh, on welfare. He doesn't leave you that way. He takes you out of that mire and muck and gives you something worth living for. God does that. God does that. Some things you're to do. You're to strengthen your relationship with God first. Strengthen your relationship. Here's a question. Number one, are you saved? You've got to start there if you're not. Number two, do you have a daily relationship with him? You say, what do you mean? You, guys, do you talk to your wives in the morning? What kind of a marriage would you have if you get up and you don't even talk to her, you go out the door, you come home, you don't even talk to her, that relationship ain't going to last. Wives, the same thing. Something's wrong there. Do you spend time with God every day? I shared, folks came to my house last night. We got a little round table there in the kitchen nook. I said, this is where I have my devotions. 
get up early in the morning, turn the light on, have the coffee pot going, open my Bible, read, pray. That's precious time. Do you have that? If not, you got away from it, get back to it. Watch what God does in your life. Stay clean. The world is out there attacking. One of the verses we shared in Sunday school class was where Jesus refuted sin with Scripture. He was tempted in the wilderness. He had fasted 40 days and nights, gone without food. He was fleshly speaking. He was at the weakest moment in the flesh that a man could possibly be. And that's where Satan hit him the most. Tested him one, quoted Scripture. Number two, quoted Scripture. Number three, quoted Scripture. But then he says, get thee hence, get away from me. And sometimes that's what we need to do to people. Get away from me. Somebody comes and sows discord. Get away from me. Why are you doing this? Get away from me, Satan. I don't want to hear that garbage. Don't influence me with your bitterness. People want to curse around you. Hey, get away from me. Take your foul language somewhere else. People want to um, uh, tell off-colored jokes. Hey, don't talk like that. Somebody, I told my class this. When people talk, tell dirty jokes, I just stand there and stare. Doesn't that make you uncomfortable? No. It ought to make them uncomfortable. I'm not talking the filth they are. You see, I want to bring glory to him. I want him to look down at me and say, that's my son. I want that. That's what he wants in our lives as well. Honor the relationship. Realize that you can have a close relationship with God. But you have to start. And honor that relationship. When outside of the relationship, let's say you're out in the world, be the type of person that brings honor into the relationship where they're not going to hear you, the world's not going to hear you tell off-color jokes or vulgar language or hear the garbage that comes out of your mouth. You're not going to talk that way because of who you are in Christ. I know there's people in this room today, they can't invite people from their work to church because they'll laugh at you. That's sad, but you can change that. 1 Corinthians eleven seven says, For a man is the image and glory of God. What kind of glory do you portray of your father? And the woman, the wife, is the glory of the man. We're to bring glory to our father by the way we talk, by the way we act, by the way we dress. Guys, by the way we treat our wives. Ladies, by the way you treat your husband, by the way we live, by the way we treat each other, we're not to bring shame to God. If you live our lives knowing that we're here to, for the purpose of bringing glory to our Father in heaven, you'll change your life. You'll have the proper role model in the homes. I want to see homes be strong. Like I said 35 years ago, a preacher said, the strength of the nation is determined by the strength of the home. If that's true, how strong is your home? If it's not strong like it ought to be, then get back to the basics with God. Bring glory to His name. Establish your relationship first. Number one, are you saved? Are your sins forgiven, washed away as far as the east is from the west? If not, let us show you how to be saved today. Number two, do you have a relationship with God that you have that time when you spend with Him? Where, where you, you get to know your Father. You share your heart with Him. Two, when you're out there in the world, in the workplace, do you bring glory to Him or shame? From the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. God knows your heart. Let's pray.